and there were writing teams, and I'm just going to um, not dwell on the fact that they had a huge amount of work to do, but in front of you, you have copies, printed copies of the scenarios that they developed. And we're going to hear now very briefly from um, a participant of each of the teams introducing the key themes, and I want to introduce Irene Beresova from Beresign, who's going to talk about Internet Islands. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I wanted to acknowledge the great work and uh, imagination and creativity that my colleagues uh, Andrew Mack and Garland McCoy have put into this uh, scenario. Thank you. Um, so we, we tend to assume that the Internet will continue to exist uh, as we know it today, um, a single undivided platform providing open access to data to anyone with users joining that pl platform every day, more and more users joining uh, that platform. Well, we try to imagine a snapshot in 2020 where this internet as we know it today is no more. And it has been replaced by a fractured net, a scenario that can best be described as internet islands. So in, in this scenario, um, individuals, companies, and governments lose control uh, of the Internet as a safe place to shop, learn, and connect. But more importantly, individuals, companies, and uh, governments lose faith in the Internet as a safe space to do any of these things. So uh, once the fate is lost, um, everything is lost, and people start looking for some kind of solutions, suboptimal solutions that would provide them at least some limited uh, usefulness of the technology that is available, and some parties start offering solutions to that situation. So governments start offering um, controlled environment where their citizens can have access to the, to the internet, but the downsides are that the governments um, have control and keep control over their citizens and their activity uh, on the internet. And these governments also control the content uh, that uh, users on that um, internet island in any particular country uh, can reach. Companies or um, corporate empires start offering also uh, internet islands where they offer to their um, consumers and their customers walled gardens or digital fortresses, whether they're uh, protected from cyber criminals, but this is a walled garden where um, companies have significant knowledge about their customers. So it's not an um, ideal um, situation by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, part of this scenario that is um, also quite troubling is the situation of emerging economies and developing countries. Uh, developing countries are effectively left off any island um, and thus the digital divide is perpetuated. So this is kind of a, a scary scenario that we imagined. And then we try to work our way backwards, sort of to see what are the conditions under which something like that can happen, and what could we possibly start doing today to avoid this scenario from happening. And so um, with the help of our discussants and um, the great work of my colleagues, we uh, came up with the following list of drivers for the scenario that are uh, the preconditions for something like that to happen. So um, as you can see on the slide behind me, national security concerns, um, it, well, sorry, is, is, is one of those. Explosion of spam phishing, um, Cybercrime, uh, farming is another one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a, a series of uh, financial um, disturbances, crises, economic um, uh, problems uh, could result in a sort of chronic economic weakness when over time it becomes, becomes okay to tax e-commerce, 
So introduce internet taxation as a source of revenue. Um, this is another precondition in our scenario. We even thought about something like internet trade preferences as, a, as an option. Um, another driver for this might be uh, the country's increasing need uh, to protect and control uh, their culture, society, and way of life in, in general sort of feel threatened by, um, um, ad, uh, by intrusion of other cultural um, elements into their own uh, national culture. Growing lawlessness on the web can make it hard for firms to protect their intellectual property, so they um, could also start pushing for these protected spaces or internet islands. And all this taken together, um, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> results in growing tremendous pressure on the multi-stakeholder internet governance uh, model where the institutions that we know today are uh, put under great pressure and eventually marginalized. And so uh, the, the bottom-up consultative nature of the process is destroyed and the system that we know today basically collapses under that pressure. So. The discussants uh, were uh, very, very actively engaged into the scenario and um, they were absolutely unanimous that this is a scenario we need to avoid. Um, we need to make everything uh, possible to not reach a so-called tipping point where from a few islands that in fact currently already exist, we reach a point where islands are not only an exception as they are today, but they become the norm. Um, so the internet becomes truly fractured. Um, also, four kinds of possible islands were identified. Totalitarian island, where um, it, it's all about control of information. Um, liberal island, where it's about citizen protection and trade protectionism. A corporate island, where customers are being protected by corporate entities. And a cultural island, where language and way, way of life and culture are, are being protected. Uh, one aspect that was stressed uh, over and over again is the importance of civil society, uh, civil society and NGOs into um, the process, in, into preventing that from happening. So uh, people express the opinion that um, NGOs' work is critical um, in bearing witness, representing the underrepresented, and um, uh, sort of serving as the resource for firms and government. Um, of course, uh, people were uh, very, very concerned about the digital divide and such a scenario perpetuating uh, the digital divide that exists globally. So uh, most importantly, and my last point, is um, what can be done today to make sure that this doesn't happen um, in the future. Um, so, it's clear that we all need to work to get together. Um, it's obvious that governments or corporations or even civil society alone, nobody can, uh, can prevent this scenario from happening alone. So, working together uh, is critical. Uh, second point is that uh, the IGF, um, ICANN and other parts of the internet uh, governance uh, ecosystem that we know today should be kept equally open to all stakeholders. Um, and another important point specifically about the IGF that it should uh, preserve its current um, structure and mandate and not turn into a policy or standards making body because this will um, be a negative develop development in light of avoiding this scenario. And last point is um, that the discussants express the opinion that we should uh, try to increase participation in um, internet governance events throughout the world. Um, and, and some people thought that the frequency of meetings should be increased. Other people thought that the already uh, started process of regional meetings is a great way to spread the word about what is internet governance and why it should continue. And, and last, uh, that at these meetings people should um, share best practices and tools so that um, the system that currently exists is preserved. preserved. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Let me introduce Steve Dabiano.